So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Venkatesh Singh Chakravarti to the to Triple I T B and uh, the first uh, summer school on theoretical foundations on computer science. Professor, uh, sorry, Dr. Venkatesh uh, Singh is a member of the high performance computing group at IBM Research Labs. He did his MTech from IIT Madras and PhD from University of Wisconsin Madison. His interest, his research interests are in theory of computing, complexity theory, and uh, approximation algorithm. He's also interested in the applications of theory of computing in uh, different uh, areas of uh, computer science, like database systems, distributed computing, etc. And uh, today, he'll, uh, his talk is on approximating uh, decision trees. So, over to uh, Dr. Venkatesh. Thanks for the invite. Uh, so in the approximation algorithm stream of the school, right? So Professor Muralidara would have covered some uh, some of the approximation algorithms for some of the problems. So we are going to see another interesting problem called um, constructing decision trees, and we'll uh, design some approximation algorithms for it. So this problem, uh, I'll start with an example for it. So how many of you have played this game? I uh, guess who? Or the 20 questions? Yes, sir. Many of you. So in this game, uh, there are two parties, right? One is uh, there are two players, Alice and Bob. Uh, Bob thinks of a personality, right? Some eminent person, and Alice has to find out who that person is by asking questions. And the questions in the classical game, they should be of the form yes or no answer type, right? You can ask, is this person alive? Is this person a cricketer? And so on, and uh, the answer will come back yes or no. Based on that, you have to figure out who that person is. So uh, it's 20 questions in the classical game, like you are supposed to find within 20 questions. But for our purposes, let's say that we want to find it within as few number of uh, questions as possible. Okay. Now, here is one example. If you haven't seen this game before, suppose Bob thinks of uh, Rajinikanth. Then Alice can ask, is that a male? The answer would be yes. Is he alive? Yes. Is he in politics? No. Movies, yes, it keeps going. Politics, yes, yeah, okay, maybe, maybe politics, yes, okay, okay, yeah. And this uh, goes on, and then finally Alice finds out, okay. This is the game. Now, what we want to do is, um, there, there was even a TV program on this, right? I forgot its name. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, 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 yes. And um, so what we want to do is, um, there are even, um, you know, software is doing this, right, to, to play the Alice's role. You think of the person, the software will find out. And that's what this talk is about. Okay. So what we want to do is, um, let's keep it simple. We are doing theory here. So we have to keep it simpler, the problem definition. So what we'll say is that, suppose we fix who are the list of celebrities, okay, don't think of arbitrary persons, but this is our list. Uh, currently, our database has only eight persons, but maybe there are 100,000 persons, okay? That's the, we fix who are all the celebrities in this world. And second thing we will do is, we'll also fix what questions can be asked, okay? This is the list of questions, okay? That also, let's say, we fix. And uh, with that setup, we want to build a software. That's the uh, goal. So in this toy database I created, we have eight personalities, Einstein, Gandhi, Tendulkar, Madhuri Dixit, Tagore, Saina Nehwal, Charlie Chaplin, and Rajinikanth, of course. And these are the uh, only six questions are there in our toy database. Now, so the, the user has, can only think of one of these eight personalities for now. And the software can ask only one of these six questions. And it has to figure out who that person is. As I said, of course, the, we can enlarge the list and also enlarge the list of questions. But the thing is, we fix everything a priori. That this is the thing. Now, given this, if you want to uh, reduce the number of questions asked, we are building the software, right? We want to reduce the number of questions that we ask. So, what strategy should we follow? As a, the, what strategy should this software follow? That's the question. How should it go about? Which question should it ask from here? Okay. And depending upon the answer, it ask ask another question. What question should it ask? How do we decide this? Given such a table. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, questions with, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, something like that. Right, question with higher entropy. Yeah. So, uh, now, before getting into what uh, we should be asking, let's first of all decide how can we represent a strategy, right? How do we represent, you know, there are different strategies possible for it, like which question to ask first, depending upon the answer, what question do I ask next, what, how do I represent this strategy? So, we can represent the uh, strategy using a decision tree, any particular strategy. So, here is one example decision tree, one strategy. This strategy says that, first I will always ask, is that a male? That's actually a standard thing people do also, right? Is that a male? So, this strategy says that, let me first ask, is that a male? If the answer is yes, I will ask, uh, is he alive? And depending upon the answer, I will ask the next question and keep going till I get the answer. If it is a no, there is it has a different strategy. In this case, if the answer is no, then uh, the, uh, the, the deal is kind of simpler because in this database, there are only two uh, uh, female celebrities, Saina and Madhuri, so it can simply ask a question, is that a sports person? If the answer is yes, then we are done. That's Saina. If the answer is no, then it's Madhuri Dixit. Whereas this side is a little more crowded, you have to do a little more work to figure out who this person is. So this is one strategy, right? There are many such strategies possible. We need not ask with this, uh, is that a male? We can ask any other question too. So, so this is how we will represent a strategy, a decision tree. Is this fine? Okay. Now, this is not the only strategy possible, right? Here is another strategy. This one also starts with, is that person, if this starts slightly different, it starts with, is that person alive? Okay. And then, based on the answer, it goes down. Okay. Now, <coughs> Uh, we have two decision trees, two strategies. Which one is better? Okay, that's the thing. The first one better or this one better for that software? Our goal is to minimize the number of questions, right? So which one is better? The second one is better, right? Why? Uh, here is, let's just formalize it off. Uh, how many questions do we, does, do we ask, right? That depends on what that personality also is. For example, if the user thinks of Rajinikanth, this tree does it with three qu three queries, uh, one, two, and three, whereas if the personality is uh, Mahatma Gandhi, then it's four questions, one, two, three, four. There are four nodes on that path. So it depends on the personality, but so you can think of the average number of questions asked, right? So we can, in other words, you can think of how many questions are asked for each, uh, each personality, sum it up, the total path length, total number of questions, divided by the number of uh, entities or the number of persons, that gives the average number of questions being asked by this software for this uh, database. So in this particular case, I marked out how many questions are there for every entity. So Saina, Neval, and all are uh, simpler, only two questions. Madhuri also only two questions. Whereas these people are costlier, four questions. But an on an average, this has uh, 26 as the total number of questions across the sum, across all the entities and the average there are eight persons here, so the average is this 3.25. Uh, whereas the next one is very ba well balanced tree. It has uh, only three questions for everyone. So the average is three. Uh, the total path length is this uh, 24. Right? So this, as, uh, as you said, this is the better tree. Now, is this all so far? Okay. So now the question is the following. The problem we are going to talk about um, is, given a table, how do I construct the tree with the least average or the least total path length? How do you construct such a tree? Can we even do it and what is, how do we go about? That's the thing. Okay. Now, uh, so okay, here is the problem definition formally, what I just now said. It'll be, this need not be about uh, guess who in particular, right? This can be about uh, any database. So you have a list of entities, you have a set of questions, you want to build a tree for identifying these entities, find, uh, construct the best tree. Uh, this is not only related to Gesu, but it finds applications in our examples from uh, web domains. So I'm going to take off uh, examples from one of my favorite subjects, biology. So species identification. So here is one decision tree, a very simple decision tree. It, it has only four, uh, uh, four organisms or four animals to distinguish between. A duck, hen, lizard, and a snake. And so you ask, 
These are the feathers, yes, as it swims, then it's a duck. So here is a simple four animal decision tree for identifying what species it is. If I have a species in hand, I want to know what species it is. Then uh, if it's one of those four, then I can use this uh, small decision tree. Here is something little more complicated for identifying uh, plant kingdoms, major plant kingdoms based on are there roots and stems, there are no, no, no roots, no leaves, then it's an algae. If there are uh, no roots but leaves, then it's bryophyte, etc., etc. That's for identifying plant kingdom. But these look like toys, right? Like as if um, I constructed them. But they are actually used by biologists in their research papers too. So these are called identification keys in direct terminology. And uh, here is a, a identification key from a published um, uh, uh, paper, research paper. So this is a diatom small bacteria kind of organism and um, a particular genus Ketoceras. These are the different species of it, of this Ketoceras. And if you want to know what um, what particular species you are having in hand, then you can use this uh, decision tree from this published paper based on the CTA structure of this organism. Here is uh, one more example. I guess you guys are getting bored, but I'm going to go through this. Uh, this is also used in medical diagnosis. So this decision tree is used for identifying different lung diseases based on um, the symptoms, right? So this is another example. So it's, it's actually used also by people. Now, given, so it need not be guess who, but it has all these things. Uh, also this fault tolerance, uh, you know, finding faults in a machine, etc. So. In general, you'll be given a set of entities, set of questions, construct the decision tree with the least um, uh, external path. That's the problem we are studying. This is so far, so good. Now, this problem, the finding the optimal tree, right? That problem is an NP hard problem. So you can't uh, construct the optimal tree. You'll need exponential uh, time. But we can construct approximation algorithms for this. So that's what we are going to do. But uh, before getting into that analysis, right, the design of that algorithm and its analysis, uh, just to get motivation for it or just get warmed up to it, now I'm going to take a simpler problem, an anger brother of this decision tree problem. We'll study that one first, take ideas from there, and then uh, do it for the decision trees. So this is a simpler, a classical uh, problem called a set cover. Uh, this one appears in many, many places in, um, you know, optimization, when you try to optimize. Um, so in the set cover problem, you are, uh, so I'm introducing the second problem, this anger brother, right? So you are given a set of elements, okay? And you are also given a collection of sets. What you want to do is select, you know, choose some, some uh, you know, a minimum number of these sets from here, such that all the given elements are covered by these sets. That's the problem. I'll give you an example. So here, uh, this is a uh, this is our elements, the set of elements e1, e2, to e6, and then we are given five sets: s1, s2, s3, s4, s5. These are those sets given to us. That's the input. Our goal is to select some of these sets such that every element is covered by these sets. Namely, the chosen sets, their union, they put together, are able to touch each one of those elements. That's the goal. Here are two solutions. Here is the first solution. I choose S1, S2, and S4. Is this a valid solution? To check whether this is a valid solution, you have to see whether every element is being covered by what you chose. So E1 is here, E2 is here, E3 is covered by two people, which is fine. It, we are fine if more than one person, one set covers it. We just want it to be touched by at least one of the sets. I can see E4, E5, E6 also is covered. So that's a valid solution. Here is another solution. Uh, this solution has cost two because it picked two sets. The first solution has cost three because it picked three sets. So our goal is to select least number of sets that could cover those elements. That's our goal. This problem is a generalization of, is the problem clear? So this problem is a generalization of one of the problems uh, uh, Professor Morley uh, would have covered, the vertex cover where you are picking up vertices to cover the edges. So vertices are the sets, the elements are the, the edges are the elements. 
so this is a generalization of that uh, setup okay at the risk of boring you i'm giving an example so let me know we can skip this if the problem is clear so here is so suppose we are setting up an institution and to run this uh, building we need all these people we need a cook a plumber a gardener an electrician a secretary and a carpenter we are hiring people to do this job and uh, six people have applied for this position right to apply for this uh, jobs and each one tells what and all he can the role she can play arun says that i can be a cook or a plumber dora says she can be a gardener or an electrician and so on and uh, what we want to do is to hire as few people as possible such that all these things are there so we are not looking for one separate cook one independent plumber and so on we are just looking for a bunch of people who have expertise in all these things right so that if something goes wrong that at least there is one person to look into it so that's the thing so this is illustration is clear right i hope okay now uh, what we want to do is minimize this number of persons that we hired this is again an np hard problem so we are going to give approximation algorithm for this problem and then use those ideas to do our decision trees hmm. so let's first design a very simple procedure for this problem so without thinking too much without over analyzing this just by the look of it who would you make the first offer to mohan right because mohan can do three things others can do only two things so i pick up mohan because mohan is the one who gives me maximum coverage whom and these are the things mohan has already done now the cook secretary carpenter these are done i don't care about this anymore now whom do i select next <coughs> yeah right so we again want to pick somebody who gives uh, who can do more things maximum number of things discounting excluding things that are covered that i don't care anymore so what you can do is again revisit all the persons and strike out things that are already covered so even though arun can be a cook and a plumber the cook is of no use so they already have a cook so arun can now do only one thing extra a plumber and similarly meena is also out of game because she is only a plumber the secretary job is already done so out of these dora babu kumar you can pick anybody and uh, let's say i pick dora and dora can do gardener and electrician so what is left is this plumber so i just need a plumber so we go and pick this babu so we are done now this is the solution of cast 3 i think this is optimal in this case but this is the thing we are given a set system we want to find this set cover of minimum cardinality and this is our heuristic right uh, pick the Uh, uh, the set that gives you maximum coverage i think i have a pseudo code for this um so first of all these are all the remaining elements what are is remaining in the beginning is all the elements so you uh, you pick the set that gives you the maximum covers the maximum number of elements the maximum coverage with respect to what needs to be done in the remaining then include it in the output the remaining is updated because we have done something more now if there is nothing is remaining or exiting this is the algorithm so what we will do is we will analyze this procedure how many have seen this analysis before to analyze this procedure okay there are some persons here right? so uh, so we'll analyze this procedure and prove an approximation ratio for it and uh, uh, recall that what is the approximation ratio the greedy is our procedure there is the opt we don't know what is opt opt is something we want to know what that ratio is and uh, we'll prove this particular approximation ratio namely the ratio of greedy to opt is never more than this quantity this is kind of unusual compared to the vertex cover you might have seen where the number was 2 a fixed number like 2 3 here the ratio we are going to prove is a bit crazy this this number this harmonic number 1 plus 1 by 2 plus 1 by 3 up to 1 by n where n is the number of elements in the input okay so the ratio here depends on the what is the problem size it's not a fixed number like 2 it depends on how many elements if your input has too many elements then this this will grow but uh, this number is a harmonic number it's uh, denoted uh, hn and it's uh, it's no more than this 1 plus ln n okay so it grows the ratio grows but it doesn't grow too fast right it's a slow growing function so if i double my number of elements then the ratio will only be changed by additive 1 a plus 1 that's all it will do so it slowly grows so what we'll do is we'll show that uh, no matter so again uh, if you recall we have to prove this for any input given any set system 
the ratio is never more than this one plus ln. That's what you want to prove. And this is the ratio. Uh, don't think too much about this ratio. It will automatically come out from our analysis. Okay. Um, okay. Now, so is this so far so good? What you are trying to do? And there are several ways of proving this analysis. Okay. There are different, different ways, kind of variations. I'm going to pick up a somewhat unorthodox analysis. That's from uh, this paper, Sikalis uh, and all. Slightly unorthodox. Okay. So this is our goal. Now, how do I prove this? Now, the greedy we, we know, right? The greedy solution we know because we constructed it. Whereas opt we don't know. It's some unknown. So uh, what we'll do is we are going to derive a lower bound on this opt, right? I don't know what opt is, but I'm going to say that it has to be at least this much. It can't be smaller than that. Use that lower bound to derive the ratio. So what is the lower bound? So this is going to be our lower bound. Suppose this greedy that we constructed fix these sets, okay? Some x1, x2 to xl. That's the set this greedy picks up. It picked up l set. Its cost is l. And these sets are, let's say, x1, x2 to xl. Now, the way it picked up, picked up these things was, let's look, let's look at the first iteration, right? To start with, all the n elements were uh, not, not covered. They were free. And uh, we went ahead and picked this uh, x1, right? We picked this set x1, and it covered certain number of elements, right? It picked this x1 number of elements. The size of x1 number of elements is it what it picked. Now, uh, OK. Uh, then what did we do? So then what we did was um, we picked up the the second set, right, the X2, and that it gave us some fresh coverage, right? This X2 might have some overlap with this X1, so that overlap doesn't count for us, but it freshly covered something, right, some portion of this set, right? It gave us some elements newly covered. So that is what we are calling it as C2, and then something was left out, right? This R3 is what is remaining after that second. So in each round, there are three things. What was the remaining to start with? And you pick a set. And it gave you some coverage, and something was left out for next iteration. Okay, it's like this. So that's the third round. We started off with this R3 as the remaining. I picked up X3. I got an extra coverage of C3, and the remaining of R4 was left out uncovered. That's what we did. Now let's look for this lower bound. Uh, now opt. I don't know what it is doing. So let's say that this opt picked these sets, right? I'm going to always put a star on top of the same symbol to say that that's what opt is doing. We picked up x1, x2, x3. Opt is picking out x1 star, x2 star, x3, x3 star, and so on. And let's say it picked up L star sets. Right? We picked up L. He picked up L star things. Now, let's just look at the first iteration of this game. There are n elements remaining. We picked up x1 as the set. And we got a coverage of this c1, which is same as x1, this x1 things. Now, this x1, right, he is the champion to start with, right? He is the set that is the largest. He is the one that gives the maximum coverage to start with. He is the champion in the first round when the game started. So, which means that all the other sets, opt picked all these x1 star, x2 star, whatever it picked, but none of them can give more coverage than this x1, right? Because x1 was the largest. That's why Greedy picked it. He is the champion. So, none of these other things, none of these things that this opt picked, they cannot give you better coverage than what I picked, which is the x1. Based on this, uh, can you give a lower bound on opt? Yeah, there are n elements. And uh, it's set that the champion set would say has n elements. Its size is size of x1, yeah. yeah. And uh, so we have to just divide it, the remaining n minus x1 elements. We have to divide it by the next champion element, and so on. Yeah. This one, right? I have n elements to cover. I picked up the largest available I picked up, which is x1. He cannot do anything more than the size of x1. So he must at least pick n by x1 sets. Is this, is this lower bound clear? 
There are n elements to cover. The largest set is only x1. So he has to pick at least n by x1 sets. Simple. So this is achievable. This is this is a very poor lower bound in some sense because this is doable only if the sets should be non-overlapping first of all, and uh, you should have those kind of sets which can actually are big enough of the same size and they go and fit finely and so on. But anyway, he at least need this n by x1. In terms of uh, our other notation, this x1 is same as the coverage he gave. So that is c1, and this r1 we are saying it. The remaining in the beginning was n, so that is just another way of saying it. n by x1 is just it's also the same as saying r by r1 by c1. Is this lower bound fine? We have one lower bound on opt. Okay. This lower bound is okay. Okay. Now I'm going to derive another lower bound for opt. The lower bound is simple. It's just the same thing I'm going to do on the second round. Forget the first round. In the second round. In the beginning of the second round, I have R2 elements remaining, and I picked up a set called H2. It gave me a coverage called C2. C2 is not same as X2, right? Because it X2 is some sets and some of it overlaps with this C1 already, and this is the new coverage C2. What it gave me. So I have a R2 remaining elements. I picked up X2, and it gave me C2. X2 is the champion within R2, right? X1 was the champion when the game started, but Given that the X1 has covered some things, within the remaining elements, X2 is the best. He is the champion. So now, therefore, this X2 star, X3 star, whatever R picked, right? They cannot give more coverage than X2 within that R2. With respect to R2, they can't give more coverage. And remember, R has to cover everything in R1, right? R R has to cover everything. So definitely, he is covering everything in R2, right? And to cover everything in R2, uh, the best guy who is giving coverage is X2. So you can see this bound, right? R2 by C2. There's R2 things to cover. X2, C2 is the best you can get out of a single set. R2 by C2. That's another lower bound. Is this okay? This is the second lower bound. Now I'm going to give it another lower bound. That lower bound is coming from the third round. You can play this same thing on the third round, and that bound will say R3 by C3. Is this okay? That's our third lower bound. So you keep on doing this. I'll get lot of lower bounds. R has to be more than R1 by C2, R2 by C2, R3 by C3, and so on up to RL by CL. There were L rounds for the greedy, right? Greedy went on till L L rounds. So these are all the lower bounds. Now I forgot one thing to mention. Uh, okay, let me just do this here and just come back here. When we did this greedy thing, right? I was X1 was the largest set, right? That is the C1. Then we picked X2. It gave me a coverage of C2. This C2 will be smaller than this C1, right? Because if this C2 can be more, then I would have picked X2 in the first place. So X1 will always give more coverage. Then the X2 will give lesser, lesser. It will keep on going down. So now when you come back here, um, we have all these lower bounds. Are these all really, really distinct lower bounds? Are they useful lower bounds, or is it one just simply subsuming others? Right? Is it just restatement weaker? Are they really useful lower bounds? Yes, they are useful because I can't a priori tell which one of them is the strongest of these lower bounds. Because this set R, right? The remaining set also keeps going down. This set coverage also keeps going down. Numerator goes down, denominator goes down. So I can't a priori say who is the best of this. So I'm going to keep all these lower bounds. I can only say that if I know the exact numbers, I'll be able to say. Till that, till then, we can just leave it like this. Now, this therefore the cost of R. I have the, all these lower bounds, so cost has, the opt has to be more than all these people, so it is more than the max of all these people. Now that is our final lower bound for opt. Okay. Now we can now divide. We can now do the approximation ratio. So cost of greedy by cost of opt. That's what we wanted to do. Cost of greedy is simple. L, a single number. Cost of opt. This is what we figured out in the last slide. R1 max of R1 by C1, R2 by C2, and so on. Okay. Now, from here onwards, I'm just going to keep doing some uh, arithmetic. So, I'm going to write this as write that L as one plus one plus one L times, and uh, let's let the denominator stay here. So there are L terms on the top and L terms on the bottom. And uh, this is simple, right? One plus one by max of a comma b is one by a plus one by b. 
so we will apply it to this system i have all things on the numerator all things on the denominator the max of it so uh, this ratio is going to be 1 by the first term r1 plus c1 the second term 1 by r2 plus c2 and so on uh, which is this c1 by r1 plus c2 by r2 just writing this this is okay i'm just rewriting this this expression there this expression i'm just doing some arithmetic to get it that's the ratio c1 by r1 plus c2 by r2 up to cl by rl okay so is that okay so far okay now so i have this sum that sum is the ratio there are l terms to it and that's the ratio uh, but there are some properties of these numbers right that r1 is n whatever is the remaining in the beginning which is n then uh, the c1 is the coverage you get in the first round r1 minus c1 is the remainder right it's kind of a zigzag thing you can't put arbitrary numbers here now they have to satisfy this property r1 minus c1 is r2 r2 minus c2 is what is left in the third round so it has that this thing right so any such given sum right you can analyze it you can just uh, express it like this let me just take a small example instead of doing it abstractly suppose there are l, l is 3 right there are three such terms it now it's nothing to do with uh, this set or problem it's just some uh, arithmetic here so suppose there are three things and i start with n is 10 and uh, i have three c1 c2 three things c1 gave me a coverage of 4 c2 gave me a coverage of 3 and c3 gave me a coverage of 3 then the ratio we are writing here is this um, 4 by 10 this is 10 minus 4 6 is the remaining 6 minus 3 3 is the remaining and then the 3 got covered you write it then uh, uh, you can expand it off and the thing is that we can this is where that um, that hn the harmonic uh, sum comes up right so i can write this 4 by 10 as 1 plus 10 1 by 10 1 by 10 and so on but i can just adjust it off to look like this hn this is okay yeah and uh, this is actually a worst case we can construct examples where this will be achieved it looks like we are losing a lot in this in this arithmetic but we can construct examples where this will happen all these things will happen so that is the hn any any questions on this this is the set cover the younger brother okay so now we'll go to the uh, elder brother we'll borrow these ideas and put it for the decision trees okay now we are trying to construct a back back to decision trees we are trying to construct a decision tree abstractly just by the look of it which tree is better the right side tree right because the left side tree if there are n such elements right with only one one element going off extremely skewed then uh, this entity will pay a cost of one right one one query whereas this entity will pay two this entity will pay three this entity will be uh, will pay four and so on so the cost will look like one plus two plus three up to n and in ten plus one by two whereas that's the total cost the total path length whereas this one will be balanced it will have only log n layers log n levels so each one will pay only log n as the cost so n log n is the cost this is quadratic n square that guy is only n log n so clearly the balanced guy is better now so with that intuition now let's for our tree let's look at the first question i have to construct my decision tree let me decide what is the first question to ask which is the root of the tree should be so i have six options here right for our database uh, male i can ask any one of these questions as the first question for my at the root of the decision tree now if i ask that particular question this is how that entities will split right if i ask is that a male then einstein gandhi tendulkar chapin rajini and tagore will go on to one side of the tree madri and saina will go on to other side similarly for each question the entities will split into two parts this is how they split for each of these questions now looking at it which question should i be asking first alive, alive right yeah because it's the most balanced right so i asked this alive as the question that's the same as what you mentioned right that's the alive now i am done with alive so i asked this question alive that's split it into two parts right now what do i do i asked the alive question how do i build my tree now yeah so we can recursively do the same on the two subsets right so left subset i can recursively do and build a subtree there 
but the right side also recursively do this same process and uh, build a subtree there so for example this is how the left side uh, left side will look like right so i we only focus on those four people tendal karajini saina and madhuri these are the only alive people and uh, i'll be left with five questions to ask i already asked this question alive within that set i'm recursively doing it so i need to decide which question to ask again i consider what are all the options these are the five options and if i ask each question the four people will split in that particular manner for example sports will split it as tendal karajini on one side and uh, rajini and madhuri on the other side which one should i ask Yeah, sports, movies, mail, any one of them is good. They're all balanced. Now, uh, so I have, let's say I asked mail. Similarly, I do it for the right hand side. This is how the split will be. Since you guys, I ask, let's say this Indian. That's a good split. Yeah. So when we split out of those three, the last slide. So we have to check all the other three sorts of it. There can be a few if we select the mail or. Uh huh. Yeah, we could, we could, but we are not doing it in this algorithm. I am just applying a raw greedy procedure. Just think of for this moment and just make that choice. Okay. Don't think what will happen in the future. Yeah. So it's just a random choice of the three. Ah, I mean that if there is a tie, you just pick one arbitrarily. We don't have any heuristic for that. Just pick it arbitrarily. Yeah. So here too, there are uh, for the right right branch. I guess there are on oh, the right branch there is only one choice. Indian is the only balance of choice. Now, uh, in this example, uh, there was a perfect balance like this, right? But there may be uh, there may be a situation where there is no perfect balance. So I need to choose something that comes to you know close to being balanced. So once I do this, uh, for these two sets, I again do it recursively. So it keeps on going recursively. So if I do it, finally I land up with the tree that we saw, right? That balanced tree. That's what uh, I'll be getting. Now here is the procedure written out as a sort of code. I am given a set of entities E. Give me any set of entities. I will give you a tree for it. So find the most balanced query. Then uh, that will split the entities into two parts: S entities and no entities. These are the entities with S as the answer, and those are the entities with no as the answer. Then do it recursively for the S, S people and do it recursively for the no people, and keep going. So the only thing that's done is here is find the balanced query, right? Maximum as much balance you can do. Uh, what we'll prove is, uh, is the procedure is clear, right? So what we'll prove is we'll prove this approximation ratio similar to that set cover, the same uh, harmonic uh, number, except that I have a constant two here, two times. And the analysis is going to be somewhat inspired from that uh, set cover guy. Okay, how do you do this? Now, yeah. Oh, for the set cover, the original line all I think I think the algorithm is age old, the heuristic as such. The first analysis, this Lanin analysis, is by Chartal or something in 1970s. Uh, that analysis is slightly different. That's what you'll find in CLR and all the textbooks. This particular analysis is from uh, this paper. This paper is analyzing decision trees, and it says that let me first adjust the set cover in a different way, borrow it. I have another question regarding the set cover problem. Is there any uh, hardness of approximation parameter? Yes, yes, that's the best known. That's the best possible. Best possible yeah, I have one small slide for it. Yes. So by the way, yeah, that's a good question. So we said that that greedy has this uh, for the set cover. We said that H n is the best known, right? Um, H n is what we could prove for that greedy algorithm, and uh, we can construct examples where you more or less touch that H n. Okay, that's the best. Uh, that's that's a, a lower bound for that ratio, and in fact, that's the best possible uh, algorithm. So that greedy is bad. Maybe I can do what he was mentioning, right? But think a little more. If I pick this set, what will happen in the next level? Next level, you can. Do that a couple of uh, levels and then decide, right? So no matter how you do those things, um, a lone n is more or less the best known, best uh, possible ratio for it, unless uh, n p equal to p. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so you said that uh, probably the uh, semi-definite or linear programming relaxation, uh, most heuristics were very fast uh, with IIT and the IIT software. So what are the 
And this all depends on the answer of the distribution. So, suppose you have a skewed answer of the distribution. Okay. What are some of the results now? Maybe you can answer it offline. Oh, I don't know. I don't know about, you know, what is in practice, what works are. But uh, theoretically, this is the best possible. Under, under uniform answer, suppose something is a Ah, yeah, yeah, I don't know. This is under worst case, right? Given any, uh, without any assumption about the input, this is what is known. I don't know about, uh, if you assume some distribution about it, I don't know what's the, what's the best known for specific cases like that. For example, linear programming, the smooth analysis does get a small amount of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other than any such smooth analysis? Uh, no, I don't know. But there are other kind of uh, things you can prove. Not based on, you know, probabilistic nature of what kind of input, but there are other things like these kind of results are known for set cover, right? Uh, things like in my uh, input, what is the maximum number of times an element occurs? So in this case, uh, who appears the maximum? Uh, e, e six, I believe, one, two, three is appearing three sets, right? So that's the four. Okay. So that's the frequency of this set system F. What is the maximum number of element? Maximum number of sets in which an element appears? F. You can actually give an F approximation. That thing is uh, known. And then the set cover appears in many, many places, right? For example, vertex cover is a special case for which a two approx is known. They are all coming from the structure of uh, the set system, right? So uh, there are many different scenarios where a set cover will arise, and those specific cases you can prove uh, better ratios. But I am not aware of, I don't know of this, you know, assuming a, uh, something about how these elements are probabilistically distributed, if they are drawn at random, those things are done. Okay, where were we? So this is the ratio we wanted to prove. Now, okay, here is a, a small change I am going to do. So, so far what we have been doing is, how do we draw the tree, right? I am just going to slightly change, how do we draw the tree? So far, what you, the way we draw the tree is, put the yes entities on the left side and the no entities on the right side, right? That's our convention. I'm going to slightly change it. The way I'll do it is, the S entities, there are 10 and no entities, maybe there are 20 or something, right? Depending on the way they split. So there is the lighter side and there is a heavier side. Which side has smaller and which side has more elements? So I want to adopt this convention that the lighter side be put on the left side, just a convention. And always put the heavier side on the right side. So for example, if I ask male, then uh, Saina and Madhuri are one group. All the other six are another group, right? So this group, the no group is the smaller group. They go to the left, even though it's a no question. They go to the left, and uh, the male line goes to the right. It's a heavier line. Then alive, there are only two persons alive in this within this world, Rajini and Tendulkar. All these are uh, not alive. So the smaller group goes to the left. That's my uh, representation. So now, given that this is how I'm going to draw my trees hereafter, then uh, let's ask this question. Uh, most balanced query, how do I determine, you know, what do you mean by most balanced query? Let's just formalize it off, right? If they are exactly half off, right, then I know it's the balanced. Otherwise, if there is no such query that exactly splits it into two, what do you mean by which one do I choose? What is the balance? Now, here are some ways of saying it. Look at the difference between the S entities and no entities. They are absolute difference. Another thing you can do is look at the, uh, look at the product. Right? Minimize the product of the two sides. Okay? In fact, the analysis of this algorithm can be done in different, different ways based on which viewpoint you take. Okay? You can do it actually with this as the viewpoint too. What we are going to do is a different. So this itself has been analyzed in different ways, just like the way set cover is. I'm going to follow one particular analysis from that um, 2010 CJLM paper. For that paper, that analysis, this viewpoint is better than all these viewpoints. They're all equivalent. You can view it in any way, but we will be uh, adopting this viewpoint that, what are we trying to do? We always put the lighter side on the left, okay, fine. Then what it is saying is, the lighter side is on the left, try to maximize the lighter side, right? Try to maximize the left hand side. So, <clears throat> so Indian is, this is how the splits are, right? For the four questions, then 
I'll pick this one because it has the largest lighter side. It's the same as any uh, other ways of saying it. Pick the largest uh, lighter side, right? Left hand side. That is what our most balanced query is. So is this okay? Just a way of fixing what is most balanced. We are fixing this particular viewpoint. Now, okay. Now, given this, there is an analogy between what the set cover is doing and what the uh, decision tree greedy procedure is. <coughs> yes, yes, yes. Yes. No, no, I'm not saying that these values are same. I'm just saying that uh, if you choose your query based on any one of these as your criterion, you will pick up the same query. The query that has the least difference is the same, is the query with the same uh, uh, lighter side. I hope it's true. Yeah. What is the yes entity is the no entity is given? Say this again. The yes entity is the no entity is the product of them. Yeah. The balance query will be different. Because, uh, no, let's, please say. Okay, I hope what I'm saying it is true. Let's check it out. Yeah, tell me. Yeah, so the minimum of the SMT is the no is Okay, let's see. You are saying the product is different from this lighter side thing. Yes. What is the product will choose which one? Should be maximum of the SMT is the no Ah, huh? Sorry, tell me. Ah, sorry, sorry. This is a max of, max of, sorry. That's a max of. The product should be max of. Difference either minimize the product, maximize. This one is uh, choose the maximum uh, lighter side. Okay. Now, this is our convention. Choose the maximum lighter side, right? Now, then you can put an analogy to the set cover. See, I picked up one query, right? Say X1 as my first query. It gave me a, a lighter side and the heavier side. Intuitively, intuitively, this lighter side is going to take more work to resolve it, right? Because it's bigger. Whereas the lighter side is the smaller people, they will take intuitively lesser amount of work to do. So intuitively, imagine that I'll ignore this left hand side for now and uh, think of focus on my right hand side when I compute my cost and so on. So in that sense, if you keep that viewpoint, in that sense, the left hand side is kind of covered. Uh, okay, this has gone to the left, so it's kind of easy. I'm covered it. And uh, so in that sense, what the greedy heuristic does is, it picks up a query, covers some entities, another query covers some entities, another query covers some entities, right? Which one is it covering? The maximum coverage, right? The left-hand side, maximizing, right? So I'm picking the query that maximizes that coverage. That is the uh, set cover kind of thing. Okay. But, uh, yeah, intuitively. Okay. Now, in, as in the case of... Um, a set cover, then you'll have that kind of same setup. You start off with certain entities, C1 is covered, then uh, what is remaining is this R1 minus C1, then C2 gets covered, and so on, similar to uh, that set cover. And as we observed earlier, this property is kind of will come back. C1 is more than C2 is more than C3, and so on. You'll cover more things first. Okay. Now, we want to derive lower bound on up. Similar to the way we derived lower bound on greedy, we are going to more or less follow the same uh, uh, similar idea here. Okay. Now, this is what opt is doing, right? I just put a star everywhere to say that it's the opt doing. So opt is doing this way. I also put that in that right hand side heavy representation. Now, now this what this opt has to do is once it classifies them into this C1 star, C2 star, and so on, it has to actually go ahead and build a tree inside it, right, for that C1 star. It has to build a tree for the C2 star and build a tree for the C3 star and so on. That's what opt has to do. Now, now if you look at what is the cost of this opt, right? It's this hypothetical opt. I don't know how it is. It's, this is how I'm just visualizing it. Now, every element, every entity, you have to see and look at its path length and you have to sum it up, right? So let's look at this path length of E1, right? First entity. What this entity has to do is, to know the path length up to the root, first it has to reach this subtree root, right? The local root, then hop one step to the root. So I can think of it as uh, two costs. 
one cost is going up to internally up to its own subtree, then pay a one cost and jump to the root. Whereas if you take an element from this tree, right, go something, do something to reach here internally, <coughs> then pay a cost of two to go to the root. So every element has got two costs to it. One is what is the cost of going up to your subtree root? Then how much are you traveling on this heavy line, right? That is the second thing. Now, so the opt, I can decompose it into two parts. Namely, what is the total cost paid in doing this internal business? And what is the total cost paid by these elements in walking up that heavy line? Now, to derive my lower bound, I'm going to give a discount to opt and say that I ignore the internal for you. I don't care about it. Just tell me what is your external. What is your heavy line cost, right? What is heavy line cost? Every element in this group pays a cost of one. Every element in this group pays a cost of two. They have to jump two things. So this heavy line cost is uh, what is uh, here, right? One times C1 star. All the people in C2 star pay a cost of two. All the people in C3 pay a cost of three and so on. This is the uh, this is that external cost it's paying. So opt is at least this much. Even though I don't know what these C1 star, C2 star values are, right? I don't know opt. Now, let's try to derive a bound on all these C1 star, C2 star, right? What can they be, right? And the idea is going to be similar. This is my GD tree. Look at the first iteration. X1 gives a coverage of C1 and is the maximum coverage you can get. So, this C1 star, C2 star, C3 star cannot give you more coverage than that. So they are all less than this, very similar to what the set cover was. They are all lesser than this. Okay, everybody is lesser than this C1. Now, I don't know what op did, I don't know where all these elements are sitting, but since I am only interested in this cost, right, deriving a bound on this thing, think of one strategy that will just minimize this one, right, let's derive a lower bound on this. What will you do? If this is all the cost you have to pay, where will you put your entities? Into the C1, right? Pack as much as, as into the C1 as possible because C1 people only pay a cost of one. But I have a bound on it though. I cannot put more than C1 people inside it. So I'll try to pack to my limit as possible into this higher set, right? Pack as much as possible into C1 star. Or C1 people are gone. Pack then as much as people into this, this group, right? C1 people are gone. So I can pack, 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 C1, C1, C1 people like that. That's the best I would do, right? That's what I'll try to do. If this is all the cost I'm, I need to care about. So therefore, uh, what it will do is that, so that's the way it will pack. Now, uh, this way it will put uh, C1 elements into each one of these groups and uh, there will be N by C1 such groups, right? Yeah, right? So I keep on packing, packing, packing. There are N elements to start with. So the number of such packs I need is n by c1. So I have to do this 1 by c1, 2 by c1, up to n by c1 steps, right? That's what opt can do the best. This is okay. So that is this number. C1 times, uh, I'm just pulling off that c1 out, etc. You do the arithmetic, it comes out to be n square by 2 c1. This is what is very similar to uh, n square by 2 c1. This is what is very similar to what happened in the set cover. <coughs> cost of opt is more than n by c1. That's what we said. Here it is slightly different. It's n square by 2 c1. So far so good. We got the uh, this uh, lower bound. Okay. Now what do you think I'm going to do? To get a second lower bound, just like before, right? But unfortunately, it becomes a bit messy that getting that second lower bound per se. So I'm going to slightly tweak that paradigm. I'll just use induction, okay? So, okay. We can do it without induction like before, but it gets a bit messy. So what we'll do is, uh, we have our lower bound, right? We are done with the lower bound. So instead of doing that multiple lower bounds and things like that, we are going to uh, uh, slightly do it differently. So this is the greedy, right? Then let's say, let's go back to our greedy. We have to compare greedy and op. Let's go back to greedy. And uh, this is how the greedy looks like. It has some question x1. Sorry, it's written as q1 here, x1. And uh, mm, now, 
if you look at every element right again think of it as going up to that sub tree root and going up to the root right so i have a cost of going up to this and then i have to go to this uh, root and every element has to do this extra jump right if i view this i'm viewing the tree in a slightly different manner this is my left side right side and every element has to pay this first query then it has to pay what happens inside right so now uh, so therefore i can write off this so whatever cost is paid here right that can be thought of as the uh, the cost for the the entities that came here and this is the cost for the entities that came on to this side so i can think of the cost here as something like this cost of greedy for that c1 portion then cost of greedy for that r portion right this remainder portion on this right hand side then I, everybody pays a cost of n so i can write cost of greedy like this n plus cost of greedy for the c1 portion cost of greedy for that r portion is this formula okay i'm just spewing it in a so we can do the same thing for opt also opt also has to solve this c1 portion opt also has to solve the r portion therefore uh, the cost of opt opt has to at least pay a cost of solving the c1 alone and also uh, the cost of solving the r alone right <coughs> so this is this is a, another lower bound for the opt but it's kind of written out in this recursive manner so now it's going to be some of those uh, this thing that um, that arithmetic we are playing around with okay but essentially this is the lower bound that's going to uh, come into play and we will apply induction to finish off our this thing okay so we'll prove this that our ratio is this by induction induction on what induction on the number of elements number of entities i have so so assume by induction that if i am given an input with m less than m then the ratio is this two times hm right i have to prove this for uh, n now when i am given a set of size n then the cost of greed by cost of opt is this the greedy is n to pay for the first query then i have to solve the c1 the left hand side and the remaining the right hand side this i have to pay opt has to pay this to solve that um, you know the c1 and the r and this is an independent lower bound that we derived uh, on opt okay maybe i should be skipping this things we just similar to that except that the arithmetic is a bit more uh, messy and um, yeah so essentially the same similar kind of thing will play out is this okay or if you want i can go through this so similar kind of uh, arithmetic but we just get um, this thing okay and this two is all right the two is coming from uh, here right the two is coming from we didn't get a n by c1 we got a uh, n by this two c1 that's where that uh, two came up in that final approximation okay now that is that bound now this problem okay so it can be generalized for uh, it has been generalized to uh, more generic setups like whatever you have done so far are binary uh, trees <coughs> but in real life there can be uh, trees with multiple branches like blood group blood group there are four types for it o a o a b a b so therefore you can ask the query what is the blood group of this person you will get four answers it's not a binary anymore that's one option one way of it is uh, this thing so to give examples from our old thing there are three types of or more types of tissues muscular skeletal connective blood group is another example if you are doing species identification there is simple aggregate multiple fruits etc and even in uh, guess who there is uh, maybe also are all possible so multiple multi way decision trees so the analysis of that we are doing right that can be extended to handle uh, this problem also where there are multi way uh, branches so yeah ah we can do that but that may ask more questions right yeah. i can simply ask what is a blood group but if you say that i can directly ask it i have to say is it a is it o etc that will take more queries 
So if I am given the option to directly ask what is the blood group, then I would prefer just, just asking it, right? That will reduce the number of queries for me. Say that again. I, you need four queries here. See, uh, if I am directly allowed to ask blood group, then I ask one query and get to know the answer. What is the blood group I get to know the answer? One query. Whereas if I had to ask, is it A, is it B, is it 2, I am asking three queries, right? To resolve that thing. So, another thing, this is another thing that has been done. This is non uniform distribution. So, Remember that we just took a raw average over the number of questions, right? As if every entity is equal in this world. So it's quite possible that certain um, diseases are more, you know, infrequent than the others. So uh, there is a probability distribution maybe, right? That uh, that person will more likely to have this one than that one. So I may use that information to minimize the uh, number of queries. So instead of taking the raw average, take the weighted average. So take the expectation. So this is another thing, non-uniform cost. Uh, another thing that has done is uh, non-uniform query cost. Not all queries need to be of same uh, cost, right? It may take some more amount of money to ask a particular query. For example, in the medicine, if the query is like blood group, then it's kind of cheap. You have to take the blood and do the test. Whereas if that query is like, find out if that person is a clogged artery or something, then that's expensive. Um, similarly, in species identification, if I ask what is the type of the fruit that is cheap, you can just look at the fruit. Whereas if I ask the question, what is the pollen type of this tree, that's expensive, I'll need a microscope to do that. So, uh, then maybe cost given to you for asking a particular query and you want to minimize that. Yes, yes, we can just borrow that algorithm, yes. That's the approximation, you know? uh, I'll just come to that. That's my, yeah, I'll just come to that. Now, these are some general results that, uh, uh, so there are many versions possible here, right? Am I dealing with a binary table or am I dealing with a multi-way table? Another thing is, am I dealing with a uniform cost, uniform distribution on the entities or non-uniform distribution? Am I dealing with uniform query costs or arbitrary query costs? This is a generic result. The algorithm, uh, this is by, uh, N is Nagarajan, I forgot who is G. Okay, so this is, there is an order log in approximation algorithm uh, known for this uh, problem. Okay, for this general case, when, this is the most general case. Multiway trees are allowed, uh, non-uniform distribution is also allowed, non-uniform query cost, everything is allowed. For the general case, there is an order log in. The algorithm is similar to what we were doing, but the analysis gets a bit more complicated uh, in proving this. Again, are there hardness of complexity in your paper? Uh, yeah, uh, that's my last slide. Okay, so for the first thing we want to ask is for that um, this problem, right? For the sector problem, let's just finish this uh, question, right? That greedy that we proved, again, that is the best provable ratio for greedy itself, right? You can't prove much beyond that one plus uh, that HN. I can always construct an example where greedy will incur that more or less that HN as the ratio. And uh, uh, in fact, that is the best known also, right? That ln n is the best known for it. Um, assuming np not equal to p. That's a famous result by uh, Uriel Fage, right? That's also, that was one of the peak achievements of the PCP theory. Now, here, for our problem, we have one greedy procedure, right? Now, let's just go back to the base version. Binary, no cost no nothing, right, the base version that we discussed. For that one, we proved a, a 2 HM, 2 log N as the approximation ratio. Now, we can actually construct example to show that that is the best ratio possible for that heuristic, first of all, okay? So this was done way back, right? They, G and G, uh, Gary and Graham, they constructed, it's a fairly elaborate uh, example. Uh, they constructed that example to show that greedy will actually is achieving this uh, log N by log log N as the ratio, right? Yeah. So, so did it prove a lower bound? Yes, yes. To say that nobody can do anything better than this uh, log right? <coughs> oh, okay. oh. Yeah. So that's a consequence of the PCP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
Now, this is about the greedy procedure, right? Our greedy procedure cannot do better than log n by log log n. But maybe, as he said, why are you only looking at this moment, right? I can look at what happens little bit uh, flies down, like playing chess. Maybe I can do better. Maybe I can bring some entirely different machinery to do this. So can you design an algorithm which is does better than this log in, in a substantial manner, right? The answer is no. Assuming that um, assuming that NP is not equal to P, then uh, 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 this non-uniform distribution, right? When the uh, when the entities have a non-uniform probability distribution on them, then this problem cannot be done anything better than omega log n. Okay? We have a log n algorithm, and you can't do better than that, right? Not this algorithm, no algorithm can do better, unless NP equal to P. Now, this comes to your the question you asked. When the distribution is uniform, these are the best known hardness results. That we know that you can't do better than two approximation. You can't give us 1.5 approximation. When the branches is multi-way, you can't do better than a four approximation. You can't do, for example, a three approximation. You can see that this is now kind of closed. Omega log n is the best possible, and we have an order log n. Whereas, when the distribution is uniform, for example, in the multi-way, the best known algorithm is log n, whereas the lower bound is only 4. So, it's quite possible that there is an algorithm that looks lurking around there, which will give you, for example, a 5 approximation, which is better than this log n. So, uh, this is open. Either improve these bounds or improve these two bounds, or that... Uh, 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 you know, um, design an algorithm that comes there, right? That's the answer all the questions. Maybe I should have put this slide much earlier. And uh, the C in that is me. Yeah. Yeah. Suppose what happens if the objective functions are made non-separable? Is that you are no longer adding? The, uh, the cost of identity function of cost of identity, which is a more complicated function relative to the L1 plus L infinity as it's converted. Yeah, I don't think people have. Those things have been done for um, uh, set cover. Okay. Set cover cost, instead of just counting uh, how many elements did I pick, I can say that this, if you pick this set, you have to pay this cost, first of all. Then that cost itself can be added, not like a sum, but in a more complicated manner, right? So, those things have been studied. Uh, for any submodular function, you can put there. So, for that itself, uh, log n is known. This is actually an old result. We'll see. Uh, a pretty old result. Yeah, because if you put in non many of the trivial things also break down. Uh, if you take, for example, not as fast as one, as fast as the other one, you no longer get the dynamic programming properties. Okay. And that sort of breaks things down. Uh, have they, in this context, uh, not in the decision trees as well. uh, Decision trees, set cover definitely. Decision trees, I need to check whether somebody has gone that far. Maybe, I don't know. Then, for example, you can have a cost per node. So the total cost incurred is the cost per node plus the largest node. Sure, 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 sure. I, I don't know whether people have gone that far. Yeah. Of course, making the problem even harder. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. But you can try to get log in, in those kind of situations. But, so, uh, the greedy approach, say, uh, what is the same for the non distribution or uniform distribution? Yes, yes, the greedy procedure is the same. We can get that log in, yeah. And uh, what is your hunch that uh, you think that for uniform distribution, one should be able to come up with uh, uh No, no, I don't think so. I think these are uh, these are two, ba two bad lower bounds. Two bad. These two and four should go up. Sure. There are some serious difficulties in uh, pushing this, this thing, right? This two and four, there are some bottlenecks in trying. Like this one is quite easy. This is like half a page. This login, when there are weights there. When there are no weights, yeah. This becomes quite uh, messy. But it's just a question of, yeah, somebody sitting down with it and spending a lot of time, then it will go off. Yeah. I have one last question. Yeah. Uh, suppose you have a system which is I don't know, I'm, so I'm saying it just because I can't find another word. The use of worst case ensemble uh, for this kind of analysis, but non-ensemble analysis are very hard. 
and it depends on the assumptions you make and so on. So True. How about if, for example, the important class of integer linear programs, the heuristics have worked far, far better than the uh, predictions of the theory. True. So, uh, especially DSP or the Ratnagravayas, the Shikara So, effectively from a practitioner's point of view, large ones are solved. So, what is, is there a branch of the theory which is trying to address this sort of huge gap? Not really, the smoother analysis was somewhat close to it, right? That's about it. Yeah, that's a huge gap, true. Theory is in some other world and the practice in some other world. At least for this approximation algorithm. This thing. The, the kind of algorithms that you see nowadays, right? So if you want to break this log in and all, it's going to get quite complicated. And uh, yeah, because you're trying to do it in a worst case bound, right? Trying to answer everything. So it becomes very, very... Um, very cumbersome algorithms, which will never work in practice. But yeah, this is for theory for theory. So the another way of saying it is, it may work well in practice, but does it work well in theory? Yeah. <laughs> that's the question. Yep, that's all I have to say. <laughs>